Um, this is Katrina, the, when it was Category 5, the day before it made landfall. Um, and we're looking, you know, from the south northward. So the Florida Peninsula is to the right. And, and uh, the Gulf states are right in front of us. And Texas is off to the left. Let's look at this sucker. Here it comes, starting to form, 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 form. Boom, goes over Florida. And then look, it's continuing to intensify. Here we see the eye. And then boom, it shoots right up. Uh, the edge of Lake Pontchartrain, right just to the side of New Orleans. And this will repeat a couple times. Boom. Almost, it wasn't the worst possible storm track. It was about 90% of the worst possible storm track it could have followed. So it could have been even worse to, if it w was a little bit off to the side from where it went past New Orleans. But it was, it was pretty bad. Okay. Uh, when this one made landfall uh, another another key part of especially the environmental impact and the danger to our built in infrastructure in the coastal zone um, is the storm surge storm surge a key aspect of these systems what's the storm surge the storm surge is what you get when you take a hair dryer and not no drop it in the bathtub because then you'll die I don't, I don't want you to die but if you take a, a hair dryer and put it near so put water in your bathtub put the hair dryer right there and let it blow, it's gonna to start to pile up the water, right? We're gonna get these waves. That's what storm surge is. It's in front of the storm, this, this shoving, this lumping up of water. We're whipping it all. So when we're, we're blowing it, but then also remember the storm itself is, is moving in a direction. So this, this water is getting stuck, piled up. There's friction with the water molecules and it's piling up. So the surface of the ocean goes higher. Now, in our most recent, in, in our Irma and, and Harvey hurricanes, there were predictions of six to 12 foot storm surges. Uh, they were more closer to six foot. In the Florida case, there were, we're talking more like six foot to 15 feet. Most of the sites were more like, like six, seven, eight feet. So, we, so the, these recent storms haven't had as large a storm surge, but that's still massively devastating. And oftentimes the storm surge is the most problematic part of this for particularly for our ecosystems on the coastal fringe. The winds are bad. The winds tend to break tree. If we're talking about, uh, you know, natural systems, the winds tend to break the trees and they uproot some trees and they do some bad things. But but the winds stop after a short little bit. The storm surge can bring in salt water potentially very far inland and leave that salt water and that can radically impact vegetation communities long term. Right, can kill off a lot of plants, can change the distribution of animals, that kind of stuff. So storm surge is a key part of the environmental impact. In the case of Katrina, uh, in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, as Katrina was coming on, we got a 30-foot high storm surge. This is at the time is the highest storm surge ever recorded in the continental United States. So let me also explain this storm surge is not, it's not a wave. It's not a whoop, boom, boom, blows over you, goes back. Storm surge is the piling up of the water. So it depends on the system, how fast the system is moving in or out. But it doesn't go 30 feet and then go away. It might start a couple hours ahead of time and start to go one foot high, two foot high, three foot high, five foot high. And it might stay 10, 15, 20 feet above sea level for who knows, three, four, five, six, seven hours, right? So this is crazy. This is the ocean rising and just going over your houses, going over your fields, going whatever. 30 feet, 30 feet. That is crazy. All the places we stay in Louisiana would be underwater if, if, that, if that storm surge had hit where, where we stay in Louisiana, right? Crazy. So storm surge, a key, key problem area with these. After Katrina hits, again, this is just my super, super quick version of what happened with Katrina, we can talk about this for hours and hours. But suffice to say, this is the, this is the um, disaster area declared uh, when Katrina hit. We mostly just think about, and then they have the state of California on there for relative scale, as to how big of an area was a federal disaster zone, meaning needing federal aid, needing, needing National Guard troops, all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, so the main thing we think about it is when it makes the second landfall in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, those areas. But um, it actually, recall, first popped over when it wasn't quite as strong here, the southern part of the tip 
of Florida. So that was part of the disaster area too. But suffice it to say, this is mostly, this is where the, the big story was with Katrina. To understand the impact in these coastal systems, we have to always rewind the clock before the hurricane strikes. So the news coverage always starts with people running out of their houses and stuck in traffic lines and they're interviewing them. And that's understandable, but to properly understand it, we need to go back in time. Right here, these are some of our students. If you guys want to come with us in Louisiana this year, you should apply. We'll have the applications out in a week or two. Um, they're due around Halloween time for our spring trip. But basically, uh, this is a group of us at um, the sort of bottom of the boot tip of Louisiana and near a city called Venice, Louisiana. And what you're looking at is what should be a cypress forest, which should be a swamp. This should be solid trees around us, no more. And that's about a meter or two, well, I don't know exactly, but probably about a meter, meter and a half depth of water right now. Ocean water, salty water. Um, uh, cypress trees are really, really awesome place, they're crazy cool. They're, they're related to our, our uh, sequoias, our, our redwoods. Really, really cool tree, amazing tree. But it's a tree, ain't no seaweed. The tree can survive being inundated. It's evolved to be in areas where the, there's at times lots of water on the surface, but it does not live in the water year round. These trees that you're looking at did not, were not birthed in the water. These trees as a seed landed on soil, germinated in soil and started to grow. Every single tree you see in, front, in this picture, those are all dead trees. Those are, no, those are no longer living. Those are legacy trees. Our wetlands have been eroded out. These trees are dying such that no more new baby cypress could ever grow here unless we do something radically different, unless we radically restore the system. So we're hollowing out the area. So, so this is now basically near the, near the edge of the Gulf of Mexico. We should have all this crazy stuff there. We should have all these trees and these wetland grasses and everything. And that would, in the context of our discussion today about hurricanes, that would act as, in effect, a speed bump. That would be land, not water, so cutting off the fuel for the storm. The trees are up in the air, and they make the wind kind of break up, so it's a, it's a, it's a dissipator of the wind. It's a dissipator of the storm surge. All that stuff, these act as energy sponges as these storms come ashore. As we delete our natural ecosystems, we are making our built environment and our houses and our fields and everything else that much more vulnerable and that much more exposed to the raw power of these storms. What's driving wetland loss in Louisiana? Several things. First and foremost, subsidence. Subsidence is a natural process that happens in all wetlands. Subsidence means the surface of the land was here, and then we go measure it again, and it's lower. That's a natural phenomenon that is caused primarily because we have our, wet, our wetlands tend to have a lot of organic material, a lot of dead plants fall in the soil, and those, that, that biological material is bulk material, so it makes up a lot of volume of the soil. Over time, that, those stems, those leaves, whatever they are, rot and break down, and get turned into carbon dioxide and all that kind of stuff. And now, and now the soil can compact around that space that's now vacant. So subsidence is a natural part of wetlands. But what we've done, what we've done is we've radically increased that in, in, in various areas of the world, but particularly in, this, in the Mississippi River Delta area. We've done that by, you go to, this, you go to Islands Cafe, you get a soda, you put your straw in the soda, you suck on the straw, and what happens? The level of that liquid goes down, right? We suck out the volume, so the elevation of the liquid in your cup goes down. Same exact things happen in Louisiana. Massive oil and gas production. And as we do that, as we suck out these, this material that's under the ground, it means the ground sinks more, it subsides more. Okay, that's the first part of the story. The next is, uh, not only is the ground going down as we all know the sea level is increasing also again some of that is a background thing the sea level is always fluctuated so some of that is just the background goings on of of the dynamics of our planet but thanks to climate change we're radically increasing the rate at which the sea level is rising so at once the ground is going down and then the water is going higher so the so the sort of combined uh things make it hard for uh the ideal condition which is ground just above the water line in the case of coastal salt marshes. 
Next, we have a not, so now subsidence has always been going on. Sea level rise has always been changing. We've been changing the rates, but those phenomenon, those, those, are, those are not wholly unique in terms of our history. Levees are, levees are a novel environmental stressor. We've never had levees before humans came around. We have natural levees. A levee is just a deposition of water near the edge of, the, of a river. But we've come in after 1926 and, and all these people died and passed away. And so we freaked out and said, we got to control nature. We can't let nature do its due. We're going to tell the water where the water could go. So we did that by creating walls or dams, if you will, on the sides of our rivers. And so this now does not allow the seasonal flooding of the Mississippi. The Mississippi used to jump out of the channel. The water would spread out and it would drop sediment. And that's one of the reasons the Delta is such a rich and, and fantastic place for plants to grow because we're constantly adding new soil, new fresh soil with all kinds of nutrients and stuff. Now we've cut that off, you know, starting in a big way in the 30s and then it really gets going for the next couple decades and then we finish, finish off in the 50s and 60s with the levying of, of the Mississippi River uh, system. The Mississippi River drains about 40% of the continental United States. Massive watershed, massive, massive watershed. And so not only do the, so the levees do a lot of things, but in the context of this discussion, it cuts off the sediment supply. This was how you, this was the, the traditional uh, ecological functioning of the system that would counteract the natural subsidence. Roughly, roughly the amount of sediment added each year was roughly equal to the amount of subside, the natural subsidence each year. So net, net, the, the, the plane of the marsh, the, the elevation of the marsh was roughly unchanged for thousands of years on end. But now that we've levied this system, we've cut off the, the food for the marsh. We've cut off the, the elevation adder, the sediment adder to the marsh. Okay? That, if we could just change one thing, it would be that. Knock these levees down, knock, knock, knock these, these constraining structures around the river, and then we would we would have the sediment going in, we'd have the wetlands being recovered. Of course, the problem is, now that we've done this, we do this in Palo Alto, we do this here in Camarillo, we do it in Louisiana. Once we put those levees in, people are like, damn, I can live here, right? So then we put our cities in there, we put all our infrastructure right up there. So simply taking down those levees, we can't just do that, right? Because now we have all this other mostly built environment that's now at risk. A fourth thing going on is that guy right there. Anybody know what that is? Cavity. Nutria. Yes, it looks like a caviar. Yes, yes, yes. So people call them like wetland rats or beaver rats. They have all these funky names for them. We mostly see them as roadkill, um, but that's another lecture. Uh, so so uh, this is um, a, a interesting critter, big critter, about the size of a beaver, like a big cat or, or otter size uh, guy. And these guys were introduced into Louisiana, non-native, so this is an exotic species, an introduced species by people for profit. They thought they could do them as a, as a, um, as a, as a, a pelt, as, as a for fur industry, and that didn't really work out. Um, so they, they got loose. The legend is, oh, a big hurricane came in the 30s and broke them loose. It's more complicated than that, but suffice it to say, they get loose, and now they are throughout this region of our country, and they are voracious consumers of vegetation. They eat a massive amount of vegetation. And so what these guys do is they come in and they, they start eating the salt marsh, or, or e eating the vegetation. And they start eating the vegetation, they create nucleating centers. They create a disturbance area from which the marsh is more easily eroded and easily degrades. So, so they're, they in them themselves aren't destroying all the marsh, but they are really acting as sparks for these places where the marsh can erode. And then we need to add on hurricanes. Again, hurricanes, an existing phenomenon. Hurricanes have always been here in, in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. But um, with these, the increasing strength of these wetlands, these guys act as, as discrete points of loss. So we've been losing a lot of wetlands. The, the, I think we're about to update this, but, but the, the factoid that we throw out for many years is a football field of salt marsh lost every 45 minutes in the Gulf of, in, in Louisiana. Huge amount of wetland loss. Um, Hurricane Katrina 
jump us forward, depends on how you measure it, but jump us forward about 50 years in terms of wetland loss with that one storm. So now that these systems are weakened, are Swiss cheesed, are, are more vulnerable, we have a hurricane come in, it, it, the impacts are much greater than, than they maybe were, say, 200 years ago or something of that phenomenon. Cool? And the system is less able to recover from that impact from a hurricane. So uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we fix that? There's various ways. And again, you could take our restoration ecology class or you could take our, our, our New Orleans class if you want to get into this in detail. But suffice it, we need, suffice it to say, we need to um, get more sediment on the marshes. This will radically make these systems more resistant to hurricanes as well as the ecological functioning will be vastly improved, better, better environments for our fisheries, all that kind of stuff. Um, the next, the next um, if that's the most important thing to do, Next would be to reduce some of the extractive processes that are, that are lowering the elevation, compounding the elevation. And then we could do things like control nutria and try other things like try to get more plants to grow more quickly so their roots are better at holding sediment and all kinds of other stuff. But the big, big thing we need is more sediment in the coastal zone. Yeah? Where would you get all that sediment? The river. Oh. River's full of sediment. So the, the, right now, the sediment all shoots out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and then helps create the dead zone. <clears throat> right, right. And so there's, there's different ways to do this. You could just pop a hole in the levees. You could, in some of the places where we work, we have, we have siphons that suck the water out. So it keeps the levees in place. But at certain times of the year when there's sediment, there's lots of sediment load in the river, we suck it essentially over these tubes over the levee and dump that on the other side and essentially pour sediment rich water onto the plain, the marsh plain, and then that wa then the water runs away and it leaves the sediment behind. So there's, there's different, there's different, lots of different approaches. But the key is we need to do this at the large, large, large scale and do it really quickly and do it everywhere. How do you reduce the Ooh, great question. Any ideas? How about we, how about we reduce this, this little animal cruising around through our wetlands? What's that? Hunting. Yep, hunting. So, so the most popular approach so far has been to offer bounties. So one, you, could, you can make them a bountied predator. So you could pay people for every tail or foot or whatever it is that you bring in. That's how we destroyed our mountain lion populations in California. Very effective way to do it. If you pay enough money. The other is to make it such that people want to go out and do this, right? So another, another approach that's been taken has been to start to produce, get famous chefs and make some nutria with onion, you know what I'm saying? And so we cook this dude up and it, it, it tastes better than chicken, you know, with all that kind of stuff. And so you want to get people, oh man, I'm gonna go eat this, right? Like, let, let's get those hungry people on this thing, right? And so, so that's been tried to moderate success, to moderate success, um, but uh, we've not reduced the nutria. <laughs> so, so we haven't figured out the magic bullet yet. We've, we've tried different things, but um, what tends to happen is these things tend to be a special program funded, right? Some environmental group, some special, special one-time fee or a couple year fee. And so they work for a little bit, but clearly we need this for decades. We need a long-term push to suppress these populations. And we haven't had the funding in place yet to really do that. And so with all the other funding needs in, in these oftentimes uh, not fiscally well-off areas of the country, there are other competing needs for limited monies. And so nutria tends to fall low on the totem pole. So to do it, we'd, all, we'd probably need some, a sustained revenue source. Or? It could well. So the question is, so what if we do all this stuff? What if we dump all this sediment on the marsh plain and, and, and restore our coastal zone and all this great, but then a big hurricane comes through and nukes it all? Is that, is, is that a wasted effort? And the answer is maybe. We don't know, right? But until we try, we won't know. And if we don't try at all, we're definitely screwed. So just because we're trying this does not guarantee success. And that's a big challenge with coastal management, right? People, you and I are comfortable with experimentation. You and I are comfortable saying, hey man, let's go pump some holes in these levees, knock some holes in these levees, and let the stuff go out and make the sediment bigger. The shipping guys go, wait a second, man, you're gonna make the river maybe less safe for me to ship? Well, that's gonna cost me money. Right? Okay, well maybe I'll let you, maybe I'll cost money, but you're gonna guarantee this is gonna work, right? And you and I say, well, I don't know. Probably, but you know, we haven't done it yet, so we don't know, right? So, um, 
what we find is one of the big barriers to a lot of our large scale management issues we need to need to deal with in in the coastal zone is the public doesn't understand some of this stuff. So the story, I'll, t I'll, what I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, then we'll break for five, give you guys a 10 minute break. But here, here's the story. So the Everglades, I'm at this meeting 20, I don't even know, how old am I? Who the hell knows? 20 years ago or so, I was at this meeting, late 90s in, in, uh, in Florida. And it was about, or I don't know where it was. Uh, I don't know, but somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so there's a meeting somewhere, somewhere in the continental United States. Probably I was coherent. And uh, the, 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 the meeting was about, uh, one of the sections was on the restoration of the Everglades. And so we're talking about this. And at the time, again, this is, you guys take our restoration ecology class if you want to learn more about this. But, but one of the buzzwords, we'll hear a lot of buzzwords in coastal management, a lot of policy buzzwords. One of the buzzwords that's really big, adaptive management. What the hell is that? I don't know, adaptive management? That sounds really powerful. That sounds good. Like, I don't even work at a place that does adaptive management, right? What adaptive management means is we're gonna, we're gonna, here we go, let's add more sediment, let's say to our Louisiana salt marsh, okay? Add sediment, add sediment, and then, hey, is the ground getting higher? And if it is, awesome. If it's not, whoa, 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 let's stop. Let's change what we're doing, change the frequency, change the whatever, let's adapt the thing that we're doing because we're not getting the response that we want, right? It's what a farmer does every time she's out on her, on her fields, right? And she's gonna go, hey, I'm gonna, this plant isn't growing, I'm gonna add some nitrogen. Ah, oh, that's not working, I'm gonna add some, you know, whatever, right? But it's, it's a fancy name and it sounds cool. It sounds sort of science fiction-y kind of. So it's like, wow, that must be modern and cool. And so everybody starting the night, everybody started saying this. All these agencies, we're doing adaptive management, we're doing adaptive management. So I hear this big, huge, at the time, the largest uh, restoration project proposed in the US was this project to, to restore the Everglades, to recover the wetlands and all this stuff. So this guy, this guy's giving this presentation. It's all about adaptive management, adaptive management, blah, 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 billions, you know, more than a billion dollars of funding for this. And I don't hear anything about adaptation. And so he finishes his talk. Some other guys give their talk. They're at a panel discussion. They're, they're sitting at the thing and finish up and then we break. So I immediately go up to the guy when we break. Hey, can I ask you a quick question? He's like, yeah. I said, yeah, thanks. Great talk. Thank you. But I got a question. So I didn't really understand the adaptive management of the restoration of the Everglades. How is that going to fit in? And he said, uh, there's no adaptive management going on there. And I said, well, wait, you just said it's adaptive management. He said, well, it's like adaptive monitoring. And I said, what the hell is that? And he said, <laughs> well, by adaptive monitoring, we're going to be monitoring stuff, right? Again, and part of this is the scale. It's so huge. We've never done this. We don't know. You know, we never tried this before. But he said, so we're going to start monitoring X, Y, and Z. And if we find that X, Y, and Z, you know, let's say, let's say they're, 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 not, they're showing no change, but we're looking out over the marsh and we're seeing a lot of plants grow, oh my gosh, we, we should be monitoring. There should be some other variables we should be monitoring to look at the progress. So we will adapt our monitoring. And I said, okay, I get, okay, I see that. But how does that feed back into the, <laughs> you know, the changing of the manipulation? the actual management side of stuff. That's the assessment, that, that, that's the, did it work or not? And he said, dude, we had to sell this to the US Congress. The US Congress passed the bill that, that funded the, um, you know, the, the restoration of the Everglades. And I said, yeah? And he said, do you, do you think that we're gonna, go, and this was the 90s, it's gotten much worse now, right? Much, much worse now. It was, it was amazing that we were able to talk to the mayor of South Miami, who was a scientist. That is unusual for most of our folks in the political world, right? So they don't, they're not scientists. They don't understand the scientific process. And then when we layer on top of that, you give me a billion dollars, why? Give me a billion dollars to do an experiment. What the hell? No way, right? They, you, they want to say, I'll give you a billion dollars. Are you going to restore the, the, uh, the wetland, Steve? Yeah, I'm going to restore the wetland. Uh -huh. Okay, great. You're going to restore it. So part of this ultimately gets to the management level and our confidence with uncertainty. And our confidence that, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to save the wetlands by dumping the sediment in. And we should be honest with people, right? We don't want to overpromise what we can't guarantee. We might say, you know, I don't know for sure, but I'm 95% I'm sure this will work. 
we, we should never say I, 100% no problem, this is definitely gonna cause this, this uh, result. These are complex systems, right? With many of our coastal, with many of our natural disaster related coastal challenges, what you'll see is you'll see a phenomenon that's gonna pop up about a place or, or one issue. And those are totally valid, those, those, are, those are good. What tends to happen is our, our attention at, from the media and our attention from, especially when we're far away, tends to be on that one dimension, that one aspect, right? With Hurricane Sandy, some of it was the, was the uh, flooding of the, or, or the, the depowering of the nuclear plants and, and things of that, or worry about that. Fukushima, the massive, massive tsunami that destroyed a huge amount of the Japanese coast, the story was on, was on the nuclear power plant meltdown, right? And that, of course, is an important story, major story, key part of that, but that was but one part. In the context of Katrina, as you saw from the maps earlier, Katrina impacted this whole region, this whole region. One of the places we worked on in Buras, well, some of the areas had 18 feet of water trapped in, trapped in there because some of the levees broke for, for um, days and days on end. The story with Katrina, understandably, the focus is the city of New Orleans because of what happened there. Totally important part of the story, real thing, huge suffering, major challenge, but just to point out, that is but one aspect of the story. In this brief overview of what happened, we're gonna focus <laughs> mostly on the city of New Orleans because that's where um, some of the uh, most obvious impacts were, but again, impacts happen throughout. The, the reason why New Orleans was so screwed, so vulnerable, in addition to all these other background parts with the wetland loss and this and that, was the fact of this network of blue stuff that you see here. This network of blue stuff are levees within the city of New Orleans. We had 18 significant breaches of the levee the so-called flood protection system. And that allowed water to rush in and, and, uh, and, and uh, flood the city. The Mississippi River right here goes around the city of New Orleans. The, one of the nicknames for New Orleans is the Crescent City. Here's the Crescent of Crescent City fame right here. Uh, if you guys come with me, um, we, while we work all around, our main restoration project is down here in this area called English Turn. This is all the Mississippi River. This thing right here, which looks like, so the ocean, the Gulf of Mexico is, is south at the bottom of this picture. This looks like a big chunk of ocean. This is actually a place called Lake Pontchartrain. It's technically not a lake because it's connected to the ocean, but it, it is, is very much sort of isolated from the main, uh, there's a small connection connecting it with the ocean. It sort of acts like a lake. This though, because it touches the ocean, this is seawater elevation. This is a river. By definition, the river is running to the ocean. By definition, the level of the river is higher than the ocean, right? Because gravity is pulling that water down to the, the sea. And here's a cross section, an exaggerated cross section. So here's the city of New Orleans. Here is the river, and here's the water level of the river. Here's the river of, or excuse me, the, the level of Lake Pontchartrain. Couple quick things to dispel. Um, the city is not all underwater, or I should say, is not all below sea level. Parts of the city are below sea level. The other common thing you hear is, what are these idiots, why did they build, why did they build their city below sea level? They did not. They built their city above sea level. Most of the original city is built right here next to the river on a natural levy, the natural levying process, the French Quarter that you guys have all heard about. That is part of the oldest part of town. That is built on some of the highest ground around. Louis, New Orleans was settled because some crazy French explorers were looking for a trading post. And they were looking for the first place that they came up from the Gulf of Mexico, came up the Mississippi River. They were looking for the place where they would first find dry ground year round. 
And they found it in this area, and this happened to be an area where the Native Americans had a portage, and so that, that's, where they, that's where they picked. So they picked the city because it was, uh, it's still swampy, it's still, don't get me wrong, it's still low elevation, but, but it was dry year-round. As the city spread, parts of the city spread into sl slightly lower, and then, and then slightly more, and then slightly more lower elevation areas because they just needed more space. But also, we have pumped, the subsidence stuff is going on. So the, the level of the buildings have gone down also. So all these things come together. So it's not as if these folks initially chose to go underground. Um, uh, we had a big storm uh, in uh, 1965. President Johnson is there. He is city floods and he comes in, he goes, no longer, never gonna happen. So he gets Congress to pass this bill that creates this system in blue that you see right here. So the idea was we're gonna put up a bunch of walls and we're gonna keep, and we're gonna pump the water out and it's gonna be dry. The US government, the Army Corps of Engineers, which is a whole other story, but the Army Corps of Engineers, they will protect this from a category three hurricane, they said. By the time Hurricane Katrina makes landfall, it's only a Category 3. By the time it gets up to New Orleans, it's a Category 1 storm. There's a lot of misinformation that flows around about this. So the Army Corps of Engineers say, well, look, we didn't, we didn't design this thing. We only designed it to Hurricane 3 specifications. Katrina was a Category 5. <laughs> the technical term for that is called BS, right? <laughs> That's not true. Uh, the, the, the system failed to, pr to protect at the way it was designed to. The other thing the Corps will say, which is true, is Congress never fully gave us the money to build to those, you know, as much money as we needed. It was built in pieces and this and that. That is true. The biggest problem with this is the Army Corps of Engineers is the federal government. You cannot sue the federal government. So their negligence, their incompetence, their failure to protect, so we. Nobody was fired, except for with some whistleblowers. <laughs> nobody, nobody, was, nobody suffered penalty. This is the same entity that guarantees the levees right outside of campus here. The same entity that guarantees that the levees in, this, in the San Francisco Bay Delta that supply roughly one third of our water that we get down here in Ventura County, that those are safe, that if we have an earthquake, they'll be fine. So this is, so again, with many of these coastal issues, while we might use an example of one particular lo locale or, or one story, the lessons are usually applicable to many, many other areas. And that's certainly the case here with New Orleans. Okay, here we go. So this is the story with Katrina. If we look here, now we're looking down at a satellite image, a d uh, day and a half or so after, maybe, maybe three days after um, Katrina hits, check it out. The roofs are basically there, by and large. There's some roof damage. If you look over to the right, there's some roof damage. But we're not seeing the typical, what we're seeing in Key West right now with, yeah. with Irma, where everything's just blown apart. The winds, again, by the time it gets up here, it's a category one hurricane. A storm, to be sure, can cause you lots of damage, sure, but not a category five storm. So what's the damage caused by? Um, it's caused by all this. Inundation, elevation predicted the impact of the damage in and around the city of New Orleans and indeed much of the area of the Gulf. So what happened was these, this protection system that the federal government guaranteed would work didn't work. It sprung leaks. All kinds of problems will ensue from this. First and foremost, oh my God, these guys, almost everybody here, had a mortgage. Almost everybody here, because they had a mortgage, you guys might not understand this, had a mortgage, they're required to have flood insurance if they're in an area that might flood. And so these guys had some form of insurance, right? Homeowner's insurance. Why do you have homeowner's insurance? Because when the jackass down the street shoots off his fireworks and it catches the roof on fire and your roof burns down, you get it your house built back, right? That's why we pay for insurance. In this case, what happens? Oh, um, yeah, sorry, you're covered for acts, so-called acts of God. Hurricane, act of God, sure. The insurance industry looks at this and goes, uh, that's not act of God. 
That's Army Corps of Engineers didn't build their levees right. So therefore, we ain't paying. Yeah, Merry Christmas. OK. Um, this is, this is what actually happened. Every, conceptually, from far away, people think that, oh, the wind, it was really windy, and then the levee broke, and the river flooded the city. No, 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 no. The butt of the city, the backside of the city, is where the, where, where the problems came from. The water that came in was coming from the sea level. Not the, the river levee actually was fine. So this is an amazing photograph. Unbelievable that we have this photograph, that I have this photograph. I didn't take it. Uh, unbelievable the guy that took it didn't die. It's unclear why this guy didn't die. What you're looking at is you're looking north out of the city of New Orleans. You're looking over that Lake Pontchartrain. You're, and this, 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 these things here are, are the, the structural supports for this bridge that goes across the, um, the Lake Pontchartrain. And what you're seeing is water coming over the top of the levee. This is storm surge. The storm has moved past the city of New Orleans and that big lump of water, you cannot see it all. It looks like a big standing wave because the water is just pouring over, right? That, so the city flooded because of overtopping. If it had just been the storm, if the storm itself, we absolutely would have had flooding. There would have been people that were screwed and problematic, but it would have gone on for an hour or two or three and then would have stopped. And so we would have had ankle deep water. We would not have had waist deep, head deep water in parts of the city. Um, all kinds of challenges. Again, management, we got to go back. We got to wind the clock back. This is my most insane place to visit. This is the place I still to this day can't believe it. When you, if you guys come with me to Louisiana, you're going to go, what the hell? What are we looking at? We're look, we're, we're, this is on Orleans Canal. So we have these canals that we essentially pump water into it, and the canals drain down to Lake Pontchartrain. That's how we drain. That's how we get the water out of the city. So this is a, th this thing here, which is a pile of pile of dirt. We call that a levee. Whether it's naturally created or human created, we call that a levee. And we could just keep making the levee bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and that would be cool. But check it out, because of the, how the you know, physics of this works, if we want this to get higher and higher, the footprint of this levee has to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. If we're out in the middle of nowhere, ah, screw it, do it. That's, like, that's great. But if you're in a big urban area or a place where you have a power plant or a hospital or something, you don't want to have this guy grow out another several hundred feet to the right because the real estate is too valuable. You have something you want to do. So instead, what we do is we use something called a flood wall. That's what this guy is here. These are chunks of steel driven straight down into the ground that, 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 have, you know, that essentially raise the height of the, the water protection. Everybody with me? There's a way of doing it without having to go, to go out here to the right. In this particular place, now, this is, a fed, this is done with federal dollars. So you paid for this. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for paying for that. Tell your parents thank you. So here we go. If we were to look all the way, way down here, another, I don't know what it is from this place, maybe a mile and a half or so down here, here's Lake Pontchartrain. This is where the water's draining into. So over here, right where my, where my back is, and I'm taking this picture, there's a, there's a pump house. And so we're pumping the water out and we're dumping it in the canal. So here we go. Here, a, a, ch a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? Everybody with me on that? So here we go. So here we have all these people that this is maybe like, I don't know what this is, maybe five, eight feet high, the top of this top of this levee, and the flood wall gives us another three feet or so. So we put all this stuff in, but check it out. What's going on? Right here, ain't no flood wall. That wasn't taken out by the levee. That was taken out by politics. So what happened was the place right behind me where I'm taking the picture is a brick, is a brick structure. That brick structure is is uh, in there are, are also not just water pumps, but also pumps for the sewage system. And so when they were building this, some incredibly brilliant people said, hey, you know what? Let's not connect this flood wall to that, to, to the, let's, let's not close off the end of the canal. Why, you might ask? Well, because they were worried in a flood, this might fail. In a flood, this, this wall might break. And if it breaks and it's connected to the brick wall, it'll rip the brick wall down, then the poop will go out. So therefore, <laughs> let's not connect it. That is literally the logic that was used. Ironically, 
Ironically, that saved this neighborhood to the right. The, the, because what happened was this flooded when the water got high it flooded here and it flooded over there and these houses these are all big really expensive mansion -y kind of houses they all flooded but they only flooded for the couple hours when the when the storm surge was high when the water was high as soon as the storm left this essentially relief valve if you want to think about this 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 whole structure it didn't collapse so they got a little bit of water the other systems they collapsed and they were underwater for long periods of time and lots of water. So this is the city on day five, and, and we're looking at here is satellite imagery of the depth of water. So the most heavily impacted areas over here in the eastern part of New Orleans, that's where, that's where the lower Ninth Ward is, you might have heard of. Um, that, that's where by far the greatest destruction. So again, a lot of attention is focused on that area um, in terms of the, the reporting, et cetera. Um, amazingly, people were talking about maybe six months to get the city pumped and city drained. They basically plugged all the holes and we got the city drained uh, relatively quickly, within a couple weeks. Um, but, but nevertheless, there was still these, you know, massive damage that was in its wake. One of the major failures was this basic engineering stuff. And with that, and we're, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is just my quick overview of this. But again, take my Katrina class if you guys want to know more about this. But suffice it to say, the engineering problems that happened, this thing right down here, this is a lab simulation that was done uh, decades before that showed exactly how these levees would fail. And surprise, surprise, they totally failed. Or at least some of them failed that exact way. So this notion of, oh, we didn't know. Well, we can't possibly know. Yes, we could. Yes, we did. Yes, we should have. So effective management is not just making the correct choices. It's also keeping our eye on the ball. And it's also making sure that whatever these management decisions that we've made, these actions we've taken, are done professionally, safely, responsibly, right? And this is kind of some of the boring job. This is the janitorial job. This is the checking, making sure everything's safe job. Sometimes boring, not very sexy, but absolutely essential. And those jobs, amongst other things, were not done and allowed a system that, sh that people thought was protection uh, to, to continue on in a, in a situation where that, that was the farthest thing from protection. That was actually um, false hope. And it led to um, a lot of people dying, et cetera. Here you see, this is this one flood wall. This is where the original flood wall was. And here it's all collapsed. This entire thing is catastrophically failed. This is the top of the flood wall that's another 20 feet inland because this whole, essentially this whole chunk has, has, has migrated inland with the pressure of the water. The initial impact in these types of situations um, uh, is what we, we see. This is where the, the news reporters are, are uh, covering and they're talking about and all that stuff. And we see the you know, buildings collapse and signs w fall, storm surge comes inland, all that kind of stuff. Um, in the case of this, uh, well, in any, any kind of uh, coastal situation, we'll have some level of flooding. In the case of Katrina, because the levee protection system popped in so many places, we had this water, and with, given the elevation, the water was sitting there, and we had all this horrible flooding that we had to deal with. That, in turn, leads to a lot of social breakdown. Look at that. Look, there's a book on Katrina. Right now, we're talking about Katrina, and in walks a book about Katrina. <laughs> How cool is that? Thank you, sir. Your art, his article is in there. Oh, thanks, man. Ah, oh, great. We should make this required reading for these. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Also, thanks, man. Uh, Vanessa Van Herden, who was a student here. Yes. Let me bring you another copy because I'm going to go see at the bookstore. I only brought one copy, so I'll bring you another one. Up. Awesome. All right. I didn't thanks, mean to interrupt. Thanks, man. That was great. Check it out. Awesome. I love it. Okay, uh, that was not a book plug. I was not trying to make a book plug right there. That was not planned. Anyway, um, so okay, so we have this impact, and then we have the, the first thing we notice is the human uh, tragedy, right? So we see this kind of stuff going on, um, crazy stuff. Again, we need, we need a long time to talk about this if you want to. But this, any guesses? To, so this is, the, this is I-10, this is the uh, elevated uh, freeway. Any guesses to what that is? Uh, well, so it flooded. So the, so, so the parts over here are all underwater. This is dry. Here's a bunch of vans. This is, this is the uh, interim New Orleans jail. Oh, no way. So they had to pull all the folks out of jail because they would have drowned. So here are all these guys. And, you know, some of them totally shouldn't have been in there, wrongly 
whatever. But there's also some bad dudes there, right? There's some murderers, there's some rapists, there's some other kind of stuff. Uh, they're sitting out in the sun with sheriff guards with shotguns around them watching them. 95 degrees, 95 percent humidity, day one, day two, day where what shade do they have? They ain't got no shade there. At night, well they have ain't got no 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 houses there, right? That's the situation that we create when we create poor coastal management, right? Make no mistake that when people make irresponsible choices and foolish decisions, these are the consequences we will see more and more. We think of the animals and the plants and stuff as we should, but this is also part of it. So uh, we see this, we see uh, all this talk about looting and stuff. Very little looting by and large goes on. Most of what we see is folks that don't have any water are going in to get water. People that have little babies that don't have diapers going in to get diapers. Are there idiots that steal TVs and do stuff? Of course there are, because there's people, right? But, but the media tends to focus in on these, on these aspects of the story, and that, that tends to, to miss what's going on. This is the real story. People going to shelters of last resort and being left there by the federal government. Two days after the storm, talking to the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and a reporter saying, how come there's people at whatever, the convention center, right, the Superdome, how, how, come, how come people are at these places and they don't have any water? Don't have any water? Well, that's the first I've heard of it. Are you kidding me? This is after 9-11. You guys are kind of young. It might be a little bit hard to remember what 9-11 was. The world changed, supposedly, after 9-11. And we supposedly said, we're going to make everything better. So one of the things we're going to make better is make sure that our response to disasters would be good. So this infrastructure that was set up to save us, if somebody sets off a nuclear bomb, uh, a chemical contamination, whatever, is the same system that's responding to these guys. And so days later, there's people that haven't, in a major American city that have not been, had their, attend, their, their needs attended to. There's people dying in the streets because they don't have medication or, or don't have enough water or something, right? That doesn't sound like good, effective management. That doesn't sound like we really change things a whole lot. Um, so that's, again, the situation we had. The infrastructure totally screwed. Um, here, this is in Mississippi. This is an oil platform that kind of became on land because it blew inland. Um, all, all these images that we're seeing again now from, from Harvey in Texas and, 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 and Irma in, um, in Florida, but this notion of moving around the city with boats. Um, here's a, an oil uh, a, a cargo container that was dumped on land. How do you get that one out? Ain't no way to get that one out. You got to cut it up and remove it because you can't possibly move it off. Um, here's one of the... Uh, refinery fires, I mean, just all kinds of destruction right and left. Um, uh, the first thing we see, the first thing you hear about, one of the first things you hear about in the context of, of Harvey and all this and that is the effect on, because at least in this case, the Gulf Coast, lots of energy, oil and gas uh, extraction slash refining. And so, oh, we shut down that capacity. So then the gas prices right here, you see the gas prices shoot up. Here's just a, a one example of some of the offshore oil. We'll talk more about this when we get to oil, our oil and gas discussions, but, but lots of oil and gas production. Um, uh, after a while, we finally get control. We only really get control uh, after the National Guard moves in and, uh, and begins to, to sort of control stuff, help people recover. First, firstly, get the folks that need help out to, to places where they can get to, and then secondly, begin to bring a social order and stuff under control. The next phase, then we repair these. In the case of Katrina, we repair the breached levees. So we plug them up. There was no manual on how to do this. We started flying helicopters and dropping sandbags. And that was lame because it turned out when you drop these big sandbags, they hit the water and they pop and all the sand goes everywhere. So we figured out we had to come in and lower, lower the sand very gently all with these pallets. And, and that's how we started plugging up a lot of these holes. And then once we got the holes plugged up, then we could start running these pumps and essentially dewater the standing water. 
The, the first talk about environmental protection that you'll see has to do with pets and people's pets and how initially people either will just run away and abandon their pets and then people want to get back and, and get to their pets, save their pets, or they want to evacuate with their pets. And a big problem at the time of Katrina, we've made a lot of advances since then, but a big problem at the time of Katrina is people, is shelters like the American Red Cross and stuff wouldn't allow people with their pets into the, into the shelter because, you know, you don't want a dog biting someone and stuff like that. So all, all understandable reasons, but it was a huge problem. So the initial thing to, to think about the environment was always oh, these poor little dogs and cats, they need, they need help, they need rescuing. The next thing that you'll see come up with these, with these things is then the environment becomes a threat. And so one of my, one of my uh, friends at my son's scout troop last night came up to me, said, did you hear about those giant saltwater crocodiles? And I was like, what? Yeah, giant saltwater crocodiles in Florida. They're like eating people and stuff. I'm like, no, nah, dude, no saltwater crocodiles. Alligators, but no crocodiles. So, um, so but, but that's what we hear, right? It's, it's now environment as threat, environment as danger sign. So you'll hear, snakes, oh my God, snakes, they're going to bite us. And alligators, whoa. And then these dogs that get, that, that get abandoned, they go feral and they become wild dogs. And, you know, oh my God, these pit bulls are going to kill you, right? And so you hear all this stuff. It's all about danger, 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 danger. That's all true, but a little teeny tiny danger. The much bigger danger is from stuff like this, this guy. So what we see here on the left, I've, I've graphed it up to the point where the, where the storm hit. This were the, these were the reported cases of West Nile virus. Orders of magnitude more people die every year from West Nile than they do from alligators. But alligators are much more sexy. Alligators are much more scary, right? Same thing with white sharks. Oh my God, I'm gonna be eaten by white sharks. No, dude, you're probably gonna die on the road going to the beach. Way more dangerous than the white sharks, but we all wanna talk about the white sharks. So here we go, check it out. Here we go, here are the cases of, of um, West Nile beginning to show up in, in uh, people in Louisiana. And oh my God, we go up and all of a sudden, boop, they drop down to nothing. They dropped down to nothing. We're almost out of time here, so I'm going to go fast here. But they dropped down to almost nothing because there's nobody there to measure it. So all of a sudden, what do we do? Uh, President Bush releases or, 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 or does an executive order to essentially uh, allow people to use crazy amounts of pesticides and, and, and um, insecticides because people are freaked out of all these waterborne illnesses. They're freaked out. The mosquitoes are going to go crazy and these diseases are gonna to start to spread, and it's gonna be crazy, so we just nuke the area with all kinds of insecticides um, to try to avoid mosquito-borne diseases. All kinds of environmental degradation, hundreds of thousands of homes unsalvageable. Uh, two major releases of oil. So this, so this would, in and of itself, Katrina would have caused one of the largest oil spills in, in history. We don't think of it that way. Because it happened, it was distributed, all these different places all throughout. But in aggregate, it was a massive amount of oil released. On the order of 100,000 individual releases of oil, if we, if we were, I mean, we don't even know the total number, but you know, a huge amount of oil. Everywhere there's, a, everywhere there's a spill, all kinds of problems. I uh, don't have time to show you that video. But, um, and then the issue then becomes uh, disease transmission. So we're really worried about, about sanitation. Again, the sewage systems have all failed. All the stuff in your garage. Think of all the stuff in your garage. All the paint thinner, all the paints, all the oil. That's all mixed up and floating in the water now. It's, it's nasty. This guy, uh, he, check him out, he's in his house. So here's a quote. He said, well, I knew it was time. This is, you know, these guys are trying to get him to leave. I knew it was time to leave when the skin on my fingers and legs started to peel off. Right? All kinds of problems here. Human problems, environmental problems. Um, we spread all kinds of invasive species. This is one of the species we're trying to control with our work in Louisiana. It's called Chinese tallow. The year before, it was this big, this guy. And in one year, it grew about, this individual tree grew about four meters. Incredibly uh, fast growing inv invaders are, are causing problems throughout the region, et cetera, and it goes on and on and on. To finish up, don't quite go yet, almost done. Um, I'll just say that, again, understand the context. This is a measure of concentrated poverty. So this means, this means uh, do folks on the lower economic spectrum, are they everywhere across the city or are they localized in ghettos or in certain areas? The more, locate, the more isolated they are and contained in the quote unquote bad section of town, the higher the, the, higher the 
uh, the index. And so in this case, this is again, right up until the, the year that Katrina happened, only Fresno here in the great state of California had a higher concentration of poverty. New Orleans was number two. So that's a key part of how things play out. We also have the key problem of uh, racism and all the other stuff, all the other isms that go along with uh, parts of our society. So what you, you saw some of this, um, and, and this is really a media thing. Uh, the analysis that's been done after, after everybody calmed down and looked at it, there really wasn't a systemic problem with this. But a couple, this got going on social media and it became a big narrative, which was, this guy who's just moving some stuff through the water and he has, you know, has some bag of stuff. Uh, this one particular description was this guy was looting, right? Whereas these white folks that got some stuff, they're, they're finding, right? So when we do a systematic, we did a systematic analysis of the media, there wasn't that, that bias. But because folks are so on edge from historic injustice and all this and that, this made it seem totally likely that when people saw a tweet about this or whatever, then they started tweeting it, then it became a huge thing. And that complicates the recovery process. So um, we're just about done here. I would say uh, great examples throughout time of systematic inequalities in environmental disasters, meaning the folks that are more disenfranchised, the poorer folks, the folks more, more on the edge of our society, they're the ones that feel the brunt of the problems. The classic one would be the sinking of the Titanic. Who was in the lowest bunk who was in the bot yeah the irish the, the poor folks the working class the guys that couldn't pay for stuff the and they had the greatest death rate on the titanic the folks that were up in the fancy cabins the wealthy folks they had a much higher a much higher chance of surviving same thing with the heat wave this famous heat wave we had in chicago in 1995 poor folks didn't have air conditioning poor folks didn't have the kind of apartments you can just open the windows and get some air going Right? So, so poor folks disproportionately died compared to wealthy folks. And the same thing we could say in New Orleans with poor folks, generally speaking, living in the lower elevation areas, the somewhat less desirable areas. And so they bore the brunt. So to finish up, here's some factoids. Um, death tolls are always a hard thing, but on the order of 1,800 people died across seven states in Louisiana, on the order of 1,500 people died. So most of the deaths were in Louisiana, most of those in the city of New Orleans. Um, we still have, uh, officially, on the list, there's still 135 missing people, but there's more than that. But, but on, the, on the rolls, that's that. Uh, more than a million people evacuated. Now, in, in, with last week with Harvey, excuse me, with, with uh, uh, Irma, 6.5 million people were evacuated. But up to this point, this was the second largest forced migration of people in uh, US history. So a massive amount of people moving around. Billions of dollars in damages, huge amount of problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as much as 70% uh, of the housing units were destroyed or, or severely damaged in Katrina. So again, these, these hurricanes in context can have huge damages. We focus on the human side of things. It takes much longer to figure out the environmental damages. Um, I think I'll probably end there because we're out of time.